And we are starting the live broadcast. It has just gone nine o'clock here in the UK. Um, hopefully this is going through it at Facebook. Um, Chris Stone, oh, Chris Stone, I can see it on my laptop. It is bloody going through it at Facebook. Good evening, Chris. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm, inc I'm incredibly well. Um, Chris is joining us tonight from a laptop that could explode at any <laughs> second. Um, fingers crossed it won't. He's also got a flashing, um, like, what is that? TARDIS it's in the background. TARDIS and a Dalek. Tardis and a Dalek, um, showing just how much of a uh, Doctor Who slash film geek this uh, this guy is. Um, Chris, I brought you on tonight for, um, well, loads of reasons, actually. One, just because I think it's going to be a good laugh. Two, me and you were out the other night, and you mentioned something, an upcoming event that we're going to talk about in a minute mm -hmm. um, that I think everybody needs to know about. Um, three... Um, just wanted to kind of like humiliate you publicly because I completely smashed you at bowling, ten-pin bowling the other night. Um, only just, and, uh, only just, whatever. No, only and, just. I was, I was, oh, I was going to win that first game, then you just came back on that last, that, that last little bit. Yeah, you did. You threw it away in the second game, though. Oh, um, no, and lost four, the second game, lost it. You completely lost it. And uh, and yeah, and four, there's going to be hopefully loads of people who are going to join who are going to have loads of questions to ask you on show reels. And I thought, you know what? I'll have a laugh answering them all. Why not? Um, I can see Richard Hale is in the house already. Dawn's here. Dougal's here. Linda's here as well. Hello. Good evening, all. Um, so I'm doing this um, again, guys, basically. Normally, I'd do like a live broadcast on my own on a Monday night. But a couple of weeks ago, I brought on great actress Annie Wallace from Hollyoaks. Really enjoyed it. I thought it's nice to share the limelight with uh, somebody else. So Chris is the victim for tonight. Um, Chris, whilst people are joining, and hopefully people are getting the email that I've just sent out to tell them all to come and join us live on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell people, we were out the other night, we were having a brew, and you mentioned, you said, oh, do you know the date of such and such a thing? Because you just found out about it. What is it? When is it? Why do we need to know about it? Okay, it's Showreel Share Day. There's been a few before, and it's on May the 3rd. This is a day uh, on Twitter where you um, tweet out your... Showreel and use the hashtag Showreel Share Day and hopefully, well, not hopefully, you will get retweeted by other actors and hopefully seen by casting directors, agents, and you got about four thousand heads or something last time. Yeah, quite good, a few. Really. It was, yeah, last it was year. a lot. It was a lot. And Petch did pretty well as well, didn't he? It's, uh, yeah, me and Petch, my cameraman, were having a bit of a competition of who could get the most views um, and retweets, etc. Uh, yeah, it was, it's, it's good fun. So basically, guys, yeah, Showreel Share Day has been going a few years now. Um, it's got bigger and bigger kind of each time. It's an opportunity, really. There's no guarantees and there's certainly, you know, no promises that anybody in particular is going to see you real and you're going to be discovered and it's going to be absolutely amazing. Um, it's just a really, really nice collaborative day on, on Twitter where actors support other actors, casting directors get involved, agents get involved, um, everybody basically you know, watches each other's reels, retweets them, spreads the word, spreads the love, gets people, you know, people's uh, like messages out there really. Um, people have found agents from it. Um, people you know, have definitely been given opportunities that they wouldn't have got had they not taken part in this. And previous years, Chris, me and you have done something that we've called Showreel Surgery Live, Mm -hmm. on Showreel Share Day. And we even did a mammoth eight-hour live <laughs> broadcast once, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, I remember that one. Remember that was that a one? long day. <laughs> Very well. It's fun. Well, it's fun. It's awesome. Well, what we do on those live calls is we um, we actually broadcast, uh, like we broadcast in two, well, we won't do, we won't do like, two long sessions this time we we broadcast last time in two four-hour sessions we'll probably do but why don't we do like a two-hour one this time yeah we'll do a, a micro one but still two Let's hours do... still quite a long time to talk for and yeah, what we'll do we do in that two hours is we play your show reels out so we play them out live right here on facebook to the ads on this community we also dual stream to um twitter well tricast actually to twitter and periscope as well between us We'll be broadcasting those reels out. So, how many people, Chris? Seventy-five thousand. Oh yeah, easily, yeah. Because um, you've got Chris has like got loads of Twitter followers. How many have you got? Six fifty-nine thousand. Fifty-six fifty-nine thousand. Fifty-nine thousand. Fifty-nine thousand. I'll have to check. Uh, fifty-nine thousand. Wow. I've got about on on the ads on this account. It's got about six thousand two hundred. Um, so we will. Yeah, between us, it's it's going to be over seventy-five thousand followers um so you're going to want to get your show reels ship shape for may the third so that we're going to want to play them out basically and that's what i wanted to get chris on here for tonight we and chris recorded a podcast on ads on this.tv not long ago for premium members that you really should 
go and listen to. It's literally the most in-depth education on actor showreels, right up to the minute kind of tips, tricks, tactics, strategies um, that me and Chris, you know, kind of prescribe. Well, you know, Chris does mostly. Chris, how many showreels do you make a week? Uh, well, shoot three to four scenes a week and then edit another five or six actual showreels. So That's quite a lot. He knows what he's talking about. And um, yeah, if you've not listened to that podcast yet, get over to actsonlist.tv, grab yourself a membership, listen to it. Someone tweeted us today, wasn't it? Who was it who tweeted us today? Somebody called, let me have a look. Who tweeted us? Maybe the maybe the watching. Have a look, Chris. Um, I'm going to check who's, uh, who's actually joining us. Inez is here. I might not live long enough to see them all. <laughs> Inez, of course you will. Just got a new show reel. So Sharon, John Fisk is here in the house as well. Bobby Calloway is here. Says looking good, Mr. Stone. Chris has got like really nice subdued lighting. Um, those on the audio experience, you won't be able to see any of this. Um, I have. I've got very harsh white lighting. I need to sort my lighting game out. Um, but yeah, um, let's talk. So basically, guys, if you've got any questions on show reels, on your show reel particularly, you know, anything you're struggling with, anything you're not sure of, you don't know, you know, the best format, how it lay it out, you don't know like what to include, what not to include. Um, get your questions in right now. In the meantime, Chris, every time I speak to this guy, it's quite funny. He's always got some tales because he's shooting three or four show reels a week. He's always got some tales, good and bad, good experiences, mm. bad experiences working with actors um, to share. And I'm sure even from, well, it's only Monday, isn't it? I guess you haven't been shooting today, <laughs> so, have you? Yeah, yeah, I've done one today. Hey, I'm just oh, right. finishing <laughs> off editing it now. So he probably has got some uh, sales from today. Over the last, let's not mention any names, but let's say over the last two weeks. Let's cover. What, say let's cover the last two months. Then that doesn't. Okay. You know, or, yeah. That or let's end. say since the beginning of the year, that should hide anybody's identity. Okay. Right. Well, give us some like you know some things that you've like maybe I don't know lessons you've learned since the beginning of this year. Then in terms of things that other actors can okay, take well, actors and implement. <sighs> Who they pick as their showreel partner is the most important thing in the world. And obviously, pick a really good actor, which sounds blindly obvious, but you won't believe the amount of people that go, oh, I'll just bring my mates because it's easy and comfortable rather than, you know, being a good actor. But the, the, They just bring their mate to a, to a showreel shoot they've paid hundreds uh -huh, of pounds for. Uh -huh, yeah. Brilliant. Um, the key one is pick a showreel partner who actually cares and by that, I mean, we had one the other day where the partner, so not the actual client, was all, was almost an hour late for the shoot and then was only seeing the script for the first time when we're on location. Because we'd, we'd, it was so late that we missed the rehearsal period, so I couldn't actually rehearse uh, with them. And we had to, well, we met him out, out on location and she handed the script I mean, the person handed the script to the other actor on, on the location, so it hadn't even read the script at all. Wow. It's just like proper basic stuff. So we're talking really about... Really obvious stuff. Stuff, stuff there. It's, um, Chris shoots showreel stuff from scratch, guys. So he will write scenes for actors. He will shoot scenes um, generally that you've written yourself. Some people do insist on writing 90, their own oh, go. That's my next point. Man, uh, something else that's happened. Uh, so oh, we write God, 99... We Point nine 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 nine. So almost every single one that you've ever seen on any of my social media platforms, we have written from scratch specifically for those actors. So I will spend about an hour with each actor on the phone, getting to know them, getting to know their hope, hopes, dreams, fears. You know, basically a whole psychological analysis to try and figure out how best to write for them. So you know, a lot of time goes into this, and then hours and hours go into writing something that works in a page and a half that has a full mini story. So a lot of work goes into that. But occasionally we have actors that want to write their own piece and it doesn't work because writing is such a difficult craft to do. It's taken me 10, 10 15 years and I'm still finding it difficult. Um, and also you can't be objective when you and the script really is the key to, to everything. It's the blueprint to everything. And if that's wrong, doesn't matter how well it's acted or, or shot or anything like that, it's just not going to work. It just... So, yeah, I had one of those, and it really didn't work at all. Any actors ever brought you, like, something that, you know, because there will be, there's about to be, like, a couple of acts out there, I guess you can write. Have you discovered any anyone brought oh, you anything you've gone? Oh yeah, this is actually decent. 
Well, or on a whole, they, are we advising people against I'll, writing for themselves? I'd say uh, just don't write. Don't write. You see, well, if the, if the price is included for us to write your script, just let us write you the script. If you want a Chris Stone scene, you know, part of the Chris Stone scene is the writing. So just let us write something for you. I mean, there's been a couple of times. I mean, of like all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and I mean, we're talking hundreds that I've done. There's only about two that I've ever put out that have been written by the actors, and even then. They've been, you know, modified or changed or altered in the edits to make them work better. There you go. So that's so how few. So on, you know, maybe 0.001% of all the scenes you've ever seen on social media have been written by the actors. There you go. So on a whole, um, yeah, do I, well, I would just uh, stick, Let stick me do to... It acting because i'm not a uh, not a writer you've got loads of fans there chris all right this isn't supposed to be just like let's just come on and just say, say how, how good chris is but it's like that's what everybody's doing <laughs> uh, patrick silk in the house we all love he's he's the best james bartlett says this evening both um we've got uh rich Haler says i've said it before I'll say it again chris is all my editing he is the man you uh you want to cut your reel um, Andrew's in the house. Andrew Lorden's in the house. Um, love the Kate Rose James podcast to put out last week. It was actually from the archives that Kate Rose James is the casting director behind Law of Duty. Uh, Law of Duty? Line Law of Duty. Duty. Oh, <laughs> That's a new that. one. <laughs> Law of Duty. Uh, Line of Duty. And because everyone's going so crazy about Line of Duty 5 that's out at the moment, I thought, you know what, for all non-members of Acts on This, I'm going to put a podcast out that is normally for premium members. I'm going to put it out for free to show you what you're missing. If you want to get that, go to actsonthis.tv forward slash krj. Kate Rhodes James, that's what it stands for, Kate Rhodes James is the casting director um, who did that. Go and listen to it, but if you want to listen to the rest, including that podcast we spoke about uh, with Chris before, um, get yourself a premium membership and get stuck into the members area. Patrick says, my reel set me off onto better stuff. I owe him a great deal. He meets you and puts the effort in. This is all just a Chris Stone fan club, isn't it? Um, I wouldn't go anywhere else, says Dawn. It really is the Chris Stone fan club. Do you shoot down in London occasionally, Chris, as Peter Revel Walsh in the house? Uh, no. Well, I can do it, obviously, but it's it's easier. Like everybody, literally ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people travel up to us because uh, obviously you'd have to pay for our travel down there, which would be expensive. You'd have to find the location. Honestly, it's way easier coming up to us, and you know we've got multiple, you know, loads of different locations up here. But I have people flying in from. I had um, Kai flying from Sri Lanka. He did three scenes of the day. I've had actors flying from. Paris, Canada, Los Angeles. So, yeah, they all come here. So it's easier to come to me. Stoke, the the, the Stoke. British Hollywood. Of, British Hollywood. Uh, but, I mean, we've got, like, forests that look like Lord of the Rings within half a mile. And then you've got urban. Uh, so you can do all sorts. And also, uh, you've kind of got to work with the weather, whatever the weather is on the day. So, you know, we had a beautiful sunset. Well, we always was in sunset, so we shot that on a hilltop. That we did recently. Yeah, yeah. There was another one with the uh, the bodyguard, where a gorgeous orange sunset. So it was like well, that's amazing. Let's go there now. And I've changed entire scenes based on the rehearsal. Going, do you know what? This is quite dark. Let's set this. Originally, this was supposed to be set here. Why don't we set it in a graveyard and it can be set after a funeral? Right. Let's get some black ties out. Throw those on. So I I don't usually have write something in the script, but it's not set in stone. Ha uh-huh. ha. Um, I kind of work with whatever I've got on the day and go, well, actually, your performances are this, so it needs to be in that sort of tone. So, you know, it's very flexible. Yeah. It's organic. It flexible. It's an organic we, process. We remember when we, so we, me and Chris went to shoot a scene to just to test, it's just like I come in to like help Chris to like test that technical stuff. Maybe it's the first time he's shooting a scene in a particular way or he's got a new camera he wants to test out. We shot a scene called Good as Gold. And initially, it was going to be a different actor was going to play opposite me. They couldn't make it. So actually, a female, supposed to be a male actor initially, an actress stepped in instead, completely changed the dynamic of the piece, and we changed the location. Um, it com- it was amazing, though. It like came it out... It completely like- changes. Yeah, it looks, it looks good. It completely changes. You know, you change the location, you change the dynamic of the actor, and it can, can, can change the whole feel. You know, you, I wouldn't have scored it that way. You know, with the electronic, almost Blade Runner esque music, it wouldn't have been so dark and uh, moody. So yeah, it's yeah, it's organic. Yeah. Yeah, that's the word I use. It's always about kind of I have a picture in my head, but I don't. I'm not so fixed on it. It's you. You can always see something better and just you know, keep building on it. Even when you get yeah. to the editing, you know, you, you've you've got all this footage, but 
you could actually create something completely different. I've turned comedies into thrillers and thrillers into comedies by cutting it slightly different ways. You can make, you can change the entire context of a scene with one single shot with the power of editing. So there was a scene, um, two guys talking about, uh, this is actually one that was the actor, the actor had written. Uh, it wasn't too bad. And it was, uh, <laughs> no, no, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. It wasn't, it wasn't awful. Um, yeah. but he needed some tweaking. This is the tweak that I did. So it was about uh, like a, a big guy. He was like, a, you know, like a Rocky. And he was talking like that. And he was all set in America, uh, New York. So it was in a American, um, graveyard and the uh, funeral of uh, his brother, the Rocky guy's brother. And he had like a little scraggly guy set to him, uh, sat next to him. And they were just talking about the brother and it was really well acted. Uh, but when I got to the end of the day, I was like, would I actually sit through all this? And my answer was no. So there's a problem here. Now, how do we fix this problem? So I did it with one shot. So at the very beginning, the, uh, the Rocky guy goes, I didn't know you knew my brother. We cut to the little scraggly ginger guy and go, eh, I knew him well enough. Cut to one shot, gun, bang, cut back to the scraggly guy, completely changed the entire context of the scene. Now you're watching it going, oh, my God, the guy sat next to him, the scraggly ginger guy shot the brother, which changes all their performances. And now the suspense because you're literally on the edge of your seat going, is the Rocky guy going to figure out the guy that sat next to him? killed his brother so every time he goes can i ask you something you're thinking oh my god he's he's figuring it out or he knows and the stare the rocky guy gives uh the scraggly guy as he walks away go, you know now changes the context to go oh he's figured it out so i changed the entire scene with one shot so it wasn't about the guy sat next to him killing the brother but i changed it in the edit yeah there yeah no it is uh it's powerful. That's, that's why I love working with film, though, is because, you know, what you get in the can, like, well, you know, the the way that you shoot, it doesn't have to be the be all and end all. So many oh, people yeah, I know shot changing. short films and then they've gone, oh, I looked at the first, you know, the first edit and I wanted to cry. And they've gone back with the same footage, rearranged it, scored it a bit differently, changed some stuff, cut stuff out, and they go, wow, now it's amazing. It's like yeah. you just can't do that with any other medium. No, um, it's brilliant. So that's what I do when I cut showreel. So I had to cut a girl's showreel the other day, and she only had one uh, film, and it was a 20-minute 20 20 short film, and she hardly speaks in it. And I managed to cut the entire 20 minutes down to two minutes and still tell the same story. Actually, I changed the order of some of the scenes and how you perceive the characters now are completely different in it. I think it's stronger this way because it changes all the character relationships. So yeah, it is completely possible to, you know, re-edit stuff and completely change contexts and make it stronger. Yeah, definitely. I think particularly when it's when you're there's a, there's a big difference between a show, show real scene and your and your show real. So a show real scene would be like a beginning, middle, and end, guys. And then yeah. obviously you're not going to put the whole thing in your show reel. For those who are because we're talking about show real share day tonight. For those who are kind of like right. I want to get my reel in in a good shape, or maybe they've not even edited together a reel, but they've got quite a bit of footage out there. And uh, we went through this in super, like super detail in the podcast that we did in terms of the flow of the edit, you know, how long a reel should be, how it should be edited, you know, all these like little nuances. Um, just to give people value tonight, can we kind of maybe go through some really, I guess, summarize some of that stuff. So you're like, look, if you've got some footage at the moment, you want to get your showreel ready for showreel share day on May the 3rd, um, you might not be in a position to, you know, employ somebody to, to get it in, in shape for you. Um, what are the what are the kind of like the pitfalls people might be falling into when they're editing their own reel together? So let's give them like, you know, okay, three so or four pit, major pitfalls. pitfalls. Uh, too long. So you, it needs to be short. It needs to be concise. It's two minutes 20. So the major pitfall is if you're editing yourself is, is being objective. You really have to divorce yourself from the footage and not put it in because you like it. It's because you need it in there. And you can't be like, oh, well, I really like that one, that shot as well. But, you know, if it's actually doing something that's the same function as something else in your reel, then you have to choose between the two. Every second, every frame of your showreel is valuable real real estate and so you don't want to take it up with anything you don't want to basically repeat yourself so basically you don't yep. want to repeat yourself 
So basically, you don't want to repeat you yourself. Don't want to repeat because yourself. That's annoying uh, in itself. And I've seen tons of reels where literally they're doing the same. It's basically the same thing over and over again. You're going, well, you showed me nothing different. This is wasting my time here. It might be in a different location with a different other actor, but the same emotion, the same delivery is not, you know, not showing me a different side of you. I want to see you happy. I want to see you sad. I want to see you um lying i want to see you know show different literally try and pinpoint in your in that line are you being honest you know write down what's happening in that that's what i do to work things out uh, work out what what's what's the subtext of the scene and if you get two that are matching then get rid of one interesting because i was gonna say that's a hard question that for for anybody really like you know for me to say well you know to say to you like now how do I know, Chris, if I want this footage in or if I need it in? But I guess that's it, isn't it? If if it's unique and it's not repeated yeah, if you're anywhere not repeating, else. So that's the most basic thing to do is literally write a list of going, right, in this little section, this 15-second section, what emotions do I get? What do I learn about this character? And then write it down for the next next clip. And if they're exactly the same, pick one of the two. The most might be brilliantly shot. It might be high-end BBC productions, but it's like, well... It's doing nothing new. Get rid of one. It's got to go. So that's the first go. thing then. Yeah, get detached emotionally from your own footage. This is why I don't edit my own because I find that very difficult to do. Um, although I've got a lot better. Crystal vouch for me. I've got a lot better at that over the years. To oh, the yeah, you're, you're one of the few, yeah, your few actors that will actually go, actually, can we try and cut it down even more? Where most actors will come back to me going, oh, Chris, can we... Because they all talk like this. Well, Chris, can we <laughs> throw it? No, they don't, honestly. They're like, can we put this back in? And I'll be like, well, no, the reason that's not in because of X, Y, and Z, which usually is A, you don't need it because you're repeating. B, it's terribly shot, poor sound. And, and D, C, I can't even remember what point I'm on. The, the C, the script is, is terrible. It doesn't go anywhere. So some of the big problems that I find when um, looking at other people's reels or when I get stuff sent to me is, the scripts are atrocious. So I end up cutting bits where, you know, you cut it anyway, but trying to rearrange it to make it more concise and try and improve the narrative flow. That's what it's all about. It's narrative flow. Um, right. Well, let's, let's explain narrative flow. So the once you've divorced yourself emotionally and you've got the stuff and you've gone, right, this is the bare bones of my reel. I've got these four clips now. None of them are repeated. The emotions are different. I'm happy with them. They're shot well. What's narrative flow, Chris? Narrative flow. That's basically, it's really simple. It's beginning, middle, end, which, you know, it sounds so obvious. You wouldn't believe the amount of people that, that um, mess this one up. So you want, for your reel, a beginning, middle, and end. For each clip within that, you want a beginning, middle, and end, or at least a setup and a payoff. So the counter, it's counterintuitive, but you don't necessarily want your best clip as your opening scene what you need is the best clip that opens the scene so for example i cut a reel for an actress and her best scene was a really intense police scene but it's so intense and slow that it doesn't grab your attention but it's her best performance so i started her reel with a fast bit of light-hearted 10 second comedy break in with a joke something fast and then you cut straight into and it was a nice opener. Then you break into um, the slow pace stuff. The, even though it's a, a best performance, it just kills the momentum dead. So you want to hook them in straight away. You want to draw them in with something, a laugh, a cry, something like that. But you don't want to be too slow at the beginning. Then you will need to find something that ends the entire thing. Like I really hate watching show reels where it literally just ends on it. And you're like, what? Well, you give them a satisfying ending you know for the clip that you use at the end have some sort of setup and then a payoff something you know going oh he's trying to diddle me out of money but actually no i've tricked him and whatever i'm the one that's victorious and ends with a smile so you know and give it, us an example of one you've edited recently where you've gone right that's a lovely payoff at the end it's not because because you you edit them quite well nicely on on just particular lines that very often are almost closing lines of okay, like yeah well that would well uh amy scene so it was the setup is um the guy her ex-husband's trying to get her to sign over uh sign a divorce thing and sign over the business and stuff because he's kidnapped her dog 
And then the reveal is, um, actually, no, I know you haven't got the dog because it turned up at my sister's this morning and I've been recording you the entire time on my phone and the courts will find that unreasonable behavior. And he's, uh, 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 what? And he's, she's like, okay, I'll see you in court on Monday, a big grin. So she goes from being the victim to being the one that's victorious. And you're like, well, hey, you were on her side. Satisfying. Nice. Satisfying. That's it. That's the key word. Satisfying. You want a satisfying ending. Of course you do. <laughs> yeah, you want that. <laughs> Always have a satisfying ending. Leave them satisfied. Exactly. So um, talk about the, we've talked about this again in the podcast. I'm going to, yeah, just, yeah. I mean, if you want to really learn about all of this stuff, guys, do go and listen to the podcast. Me and Chris did a 90 minute podcast where we break it down into seven steps, basically. But we're just, we're just going to, you know, recap on some stuff tonight. Thematic cuts in showreels are, I find particularly interesting. And you're very good at them, Chris. Tell, okay. tell them what they are. So this is to so get it to all to flow because you're going to have scenes and clips from different, completely different TV shows, but it's how to get them, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, it's how to get them to try and join seamlessly. And there's tons of ways you can do this. So thematically, you can use uh, a line of one end of dialogue and a visual from, an, uh, from the start of the next one. So I did a brilliant, one of my favorite cuts was um, they were talking about uh, it was an office sort of scene, and he was talking about bin bags. Putting the oh, you can yeah, put the bin bags out. Put the put out the bags. Ending on the word bags. On the word bags, I cut to a close up of a bag of cocaine, which then became the beginning of the next scene. So you're th trying to find things that connect the two, or it could be uh, an actor walks out and slams the door, and the slam becomes the cut of the. A gun being fired. Do you know what I mean? So you've got a sound related uh, cut. Um, or, well, yeah, or lines of dialogue that sound similar. Um, oh, this is one that actually got cut from a showreel recently, which I thought was a particularly good cut. I'm not being bitter <laughs> or anything. But uh, we would, uh, so it ends with the two actors going, but we were just too different. And then it cuts to the next scene. And it goes, your hair, it's so different. So you connect the word different and that becomes the the kind of the glue that joins the two scenes together. Nice. You know who that is. I'm gonna, I was about to say, I'm sure that, that scene, yes, that, that yeah, where we're just yeah. too different is a scene that I was in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was. It was yeah, yeah. It's a uh, yeah. great scene. Love it. It is a good scene. It is a good scene. But yeah, that was the connecting points, you know, because I, I went through all, all of that person's footage and found that was a nice opening line for that scene. And that was a nice ending line for your scene, connecting the two. So you got to, we were two different. Whoa, what's changed? Yeah, it's different. And it's like you have the a repeat and echo of a line. So you, yeah. you can do it that way as well. So, but yeah, you can use sound, you can use visuals um yeah find ways of connecting the two creatively yeah the dialogue um etc it's interesting so this is it's just like things like that just make your show real so much more watchable guys than just whacking five completely unconnected pieces of footage one after the other where it's just you know this is what a lot of actors seem to think editing is when it's show real edit they get the you know they get iMovie out on their mac they've got their three main scenes and they just go straight cut straight cut straight cut put them together export it out done um, you can and it, so, go on. Go on. I was about to say you can create a lot of humour with the cuts as well. So we always use Petches as a uh, example. So oh, they, they, has, they were great. Yeah, tell, tell the story. Has, of okay, so Petch has four, <laughs> I think it's four or five, four scenes on his, and completely unrelated shot, months or oh, years apart, but they end up telling a complete story, the story of Petch. Um, and his in, love life in love life and four cuts basically sums up sums up patch so it starts off with him uh with dawn in a graveyard auntie dawn who's trying to give him encouragement to go ask out a girl so he's all nervous he's a great opener as well so he's a good opener and it's like i, I think i'll do it i'll go ask her out cut to door open him asking out this older lady completely unrelated scene and trying to chat up this older lady that he's met up online who, who's actually his girlfriend's mum and then it cuts to um, him getting rejected by her and then him building or working on this, this completely unrelated scene 
uh, reprogramming this young female uh, android robot for sex. And this android does not like this at all and uh, fights against the programming. It ends up grabbing Petch by the neck, breaking his neck, and killing him, him. Dying, killing him. And then it cuts to him in a car with a woman go, oh, and that's why I can't ask women out. So it's like having all these failures with women and it just ends with a punchline there. And it's really Please. interesting because none of that was planned. So it was like these scenes were shot literally years apart. This 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 mini story within the the reel was put together in the edit. It was never imagined yeah, never before that. Like that. They were there were a mixture of Petch's scenes that he'd um, you know paid for and stuff that you know he'd been on other people's scenes. So it's completely completely unrelated and unplanned. But yeah, it was all created in the edit. So when I when I put them all down and looked at it, it was like, well, there's a, there's a mini narrative here. So beginning, yeah. middle, and end. And you've been through this entire journey with him. By the end of it, you're like, oh, poor lad, come on. Poor he's lad, just he's, so uh, unlucky in love. He's been killed. Hayley yeah. Cartwright's in the house has finally made it to a live. All right, Hayley, hope you are well. Uh, Mark Joseph says, Chris, I'm going to hit you up to um, recut the short version of the scenes that we did. Um, Kevin Flanagan's here as well from Dublin. All right, Kev, uh, hope you are well. Bobby's here from Ireland as well. Uh, Linda says, how can we get hold of Chris's phone number, etc.? Um, all on your website, Chris, yeah? It's all on my website, www.chrisstoneshowreels.com. Chrisstoneshowreels.com. But don't ring me right now because uh, because I'm He's live. I'm live, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah show Somebody reels, ring him right now. No, because I've already so we, can on prove, mode. we can prove it's live. Um, yeah, I didn't just bring um, Chris on to just like big him up, guys. Got, give me some questions for him, something challenging, you know, anything you want to know about your show reel, anything you're, you're struggling with, maybe you want to like have a little foray into editing you don't know what software to use you want to ask what chris uses i don't know anything that like you want to ask tech stuff or anything like that. you got a new camera recently chris didn't you how's that how's that working out for yeah, you it's, i haven't actually played with the footage yet i've um, filmed a load of stuff on it but i haven't i haven't actually edited it i haven't had time because i've been doing everybody else's reels <laughs> So um, do it. Well, you get a mind to do. I'm getting a, a headshot done by Tony Blake on Thursday, and um, then yeah, um, if you won't mind, mate, um, yeah, going to need you to <laughs> do uh, a new cut of my reel, definitely. And then I'll have this stuff from uh, years and years soon, which will then have to go in it. That's something that's really interesting. Uh, we can talk a little bit about is because your reel's always a work in progress. What me and Chris do is we already know from the edit that we have right now, and we've known this for for a while. Every edit we do. We already know what the next, basically, if I've got a TV job coming up, but I've not got the footage yet. So I've just done this thing for BBC One called Years and Years. Great new drama. Got two episodes in that. I'm going to have some nice scenes in that. So I know that I'm going to want to put some of that stuff because it's new in my reel. Now, because I don't want my reel to go over two minutes and 20 seconds, and the reason me and Chris say your reel shouldn't be over two minutes and 20 seconds is so you can upload it directly to a tweet within Twitter. Twitter, without a doubt, is the number one platform where actors hang out. Instagram is still very big. It's up and coming. Twitter's still where you know, the industry hangs out, to be honest with you. It's still the platform that dominates. You can upload a, a a movie clip natively to a tweet as long as it's not over two minutes and 20 seconds. So I think anybody who's getting a showreel cut to over two minutes and 20 these days in 2019 um, isn't, I just don't think you need it to be longer than that. I just think, you know, you're not going to be able to take advantage of, uh, you know, Twitter or you're only going to be able to put a bit of your, uh, your showreel on there. But me yeah. and you, Chris, we always know what's, piece of footage we're then going to remove from my reel in which you know and which one's going to kind of like replace it mm -hmm. um in terms of people you know might want to uh jazz up their show reels because they just want a bit of variety maybe they've had the show reel for like the last year you know it's been all right with them but they know they're like this one to get some variety but they don't have something up and coming on, on tv um again what you know what what would you recommend there in terms of like going out and shooting something that's contrasting or I don't know, getting involved with short films to get something, getting someone to write something specifically for them. Um, if people are out there and they're like, look, I just want, I just want an update on my reel like now. So, you know, I want some new footage to come up. I know I've got this scene that lets it down. want to throw it away. want to replace it with something. What other stuff can they do? Um, well, I said, you can go out and find short films. So you can go out and find some student stuff or you can come to you know somebody like me and get something written specifically for them to show them off. Um, that's be the two ways really of doing it that I could think of. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, there's advantage of both. 
It's just, it's just, it's just well, where well, would where well, would you look for? Yeah, what what would what would you be looking for? Is it right? Because you know a lot about this because you teach students in film as well, right? Yeah. So you you see student filmmakers creating films and me and you have spoke on the phone sometimes and so equally sometimes you've gone oh my god this i thought this was going to be good and it's turned out terrible and then you said you've oh, you've been like I've had, raving I've that have been made some amazing stuff but so right you've got to go in just how do, do you know well, go, <laughs> so you look for the casting calls that the students put out and then go have a look at their previous work what you don't want to be doing is wasting your time doing this sounds terrible, but working on a student film that's going to be a is not going to be very good and it's maybe even not get completed. So, you know, take your time because you know, you you, know, you might think you're getting like this footage for free for your showreel, but it's still an investment of your time. So you don't want to waste your time. So, you know, maybe you know, just do a little bit of research to see if the student is actually competent that's the other thing you've got to remember is students are learning i've had students who have, to have come back to me and gone oh yeah i've done a film but I've, the sound didn't come out okay or they've lost the hard drives or something's gone terribly wrong so you know but then this is what they're designed to do it's you know it's designed so they fail so they can learn from the mistakes so you can't expect it to be perfect because they're not professionals yet they're still learning. So you have to take that into consideration. So anybody who thinks they're gonna build up their entire showreel just on student stuff, the chances of that, of getting really good stuff to actually make a decent showreel is, is very small, very limited, if I'm honest. And you know, yeah, I'm no. saying this from the point of view of, you know, I, I want my students to succeed, but out of you know, the 20 odd that I would teach, maybe one, you go, that's really good, that's really strong. But the rest of them have gone, okay, well, you still need a lot, you know, a lot of work, you know, but you, you're learning from it, okay, so you haven't recorded your sound this time, so, but next time you'll remember to record this, or you shot it with a lens cap on. That's a little <laughs> bit of an error. How did you manage to happen? Or you've lost your entire footage, why didn't you back it up? Oh, I didn't think I needed to back it up, you need to back it up. So, you know, not- It's not one of those things. Yet. Yeah, you know, yeah, they are obviously, you know, they're learning, and that's the that's the risk that you end up taking when you're working with them. Um, I think sometimes it can be a false economy, whereas people think, oh, I'm getting footage for free, where actually you go, well, you've actually just gone and spent four days of your time, and time isn't free. Yeah. Um, you could have worked even in a minimum wage job for eight hour shifts over those four days, thirty two hours. That's enough to pay somebody to write and you know shoot a showreel scene for you. Um, Dougal's got an interesting question. I know my thoughts on this. Um, I think I probably know yours. He says, I know you said don't use class scenes, but where I go, it's Manchester Film School that do the whole production and edit of scenes. Would it be all right to use these? I know exactly what you're talking about. And every person that's come to me with the Manchester Film School, I've not used the clips because they've been atrocious. And that's me being brutally honest there. They oh, have not, brutal. that is not, they have not worked at all. And I've, I've said, do not use these because they bring down the quality of the reel. The only time that I've ever put one in was on the insistence of the actor. And I showed you, I sent you this reel, Ross, and uh, I cut it beautifully. You've seen this one. It was beautifully all put mean. together and it all flows so well. And then the actress insisted on putting one of these scenes in and, I, and it completely wrecks the flow also doing um the scenes there they're all using the exact same script that doesn't help anybody when casting directors see the same scene over and over again they're going to get bored and how can the say uh, one actor have you know one script be right for every single actor not everybody's going to have the same casting type it's again it's false economy um they don't work and the for practice Brilliant, but don't use them for show reels. No, I wouldn't use them for show reels in the slightest bit. The quality is not good enough. And the scripts are, how do I put this politely, atrocious. And I mean, really, and I've seen some actors that I've actually worked with in the past that I know are good, and then they've come to me to put that stuff in. And I have to flat refute, and I've said, do not use this. Well, I will not use this because it is so bad and it makes you look bad. And I know you're better than this. That's the thing you want. You want. It's not about ramming absolutely everything into your reel. 
you want to put the cream of the cream. It's about teasing them. You, so you, your your quotes from the casting director, I can't remember who which casting director, it was like, they're always looking for a reason not to bring you in. So Kelly you might Barnes have like, Henry. yeah, there you go. And, Broadchurch, uh, huge, huge casting director. So you want to put in absolutely good stuff. You don't put anything in that's rubbish. Why would you put anything that's subpar? You know, you might have three clips of absolute brilliance. They're going, oh, this is amazing. Oh, Ross is amazing. And suddenly it's one that's subpar and really lets it down. They're like, okay, maybe not. So they're always looking for some reason not to bring you in. So what I'd say is don't use stuff that's shot in class. I always say don't use stuff shot in class because they, A, they don't have the time and the resources to make it um, well enough. B, you're all using the exact same scripts and that's going to bore anybody to tears. I've seen, because I've been sent the, the, the same scene over and over again and it's just not worked. And see, they are still students. The sound on some of those scenes is terrible. And I've tried my damnedest to try and recover and make it better, but no. So what I'd say is, don't, you know, it's up to you, but if you want some professional advice that's done, you know, several thousand of these, I wouldn't use it. One thing you will find out about Chris is he's absolutely brutally honest. But if you do ask him a question, he will always answer honestly. Um, I'll always an an answer you honestly, and there's no point beating about the bush. Um, for practice, brilliant. You know, go ahead and shoot. The more time you can spend in front of the camera, the better. But try and spend time in front of the camera with people that actually know what they're doing, and you'll learn a lot faster. Um, I just, it's, you don't have to put stuff in just because you you filmed it and just for the sake of it. If you've got to look at it objectively or if you can't be objective about it, you need somebody that's outside it, outside uh, and be completely objective about it and go, no, don't put that in. That'll, that'll destroy your reel. You know, asking friends and family, maybe even other actors, they'll go, oh yeah, that's amazing. That's not the true opinion. You need somebody that will just cut through it all and go, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, you do need some uh, emotionless honesty. I think for me, yeah, you know, scenes like that, again, I, I think sometimes it's, a, it's almost a little bit naughty that I think a lot of acting classes will will market. These days it's become quite trendy for acting class to market themselves as we will supply you with showreel footage from the classes. They shouldn't be calling it showreel footage. Um, the stuff that's being shot in class, because of the reasons that Chris mentioned, it's all shot in the same place. You're very often working on the same scripts as 10 other couples, if they're dual logs or whatever. Um, you will end up with you know, the same piece shot in the same place. Um, it doesn't lend itself super well to your show your own material. It's generally not a location that's really set up for shooting in. Um, they don't have the attention so when it comes to lighting audio they don't have the time to grade them it's not real show real footage to be honest it's brilliant for practice and the best thing that i get from classes and stuff that i go to and you get the footage back from is um, you get to watch your own performance so you get to critique yourself it's stuff that i would definitely show an agent if i was looking to get an agent because an agent just wants to see you act and see your ability they're not too bothered about the quality of the stuff but for a casting director um it's gonna have to be more pro than that um otherwise they'll still you know that the their initial reaction is going to be that you know you're not working on professional stuff as of yet so if you've That's got exactly no footage it. then you know by all means if you're starting off and you're brand new at the industry and you just want to get a bit of exposure whack that footage out there um but Dougal, you're not man you've got tv stuff so um less is more man i think you, you stick to your tv stuff dude and um get some you know you utilize that as currency um for now kevin uh, this is a different question so kev um, it depends on what you are looking for work-wise. Um, if, if this is to apply for TV stuff, the answer is definitely no. But uh, Kev's put, can you put in Shakespeare scenes if they've been properly shot? Um, uh, what's he put here? I was in Macbeth and Lear, and there's some very strong material. Madness, badness, and the whole world of emotions. Uh, for TV, Kev, monologues and stuff, or like theatre, I wouldn't use it. Um, for, for if you want to try and get more theatre, definitely. You know, that's absolutely fine mm -hmm. for a theatre casting director. But what's your opinion, Chris? Have you ever oh, shot any, have you ever yeah, put any theatre in anyone's reel? Yeah, yeah. I've, for, for actors who specifically are for theatre, I've done monologues, Shakespeare monologues, Shakespeare uh, performances, uh, Shakespeare scenes. But um, they were actors that were go specifically going for theatre, not film. 
And when anybody ever comes to me and says, I want to do a monologue, I ask them going, right, what do you want to get into, film or theatre? If, uh, if it's film and TV, then don't do a monologue. That is very theatrical. The bread and butter of TV is two people talking. So, you know, just do a dual log. Um, it's all about action and reaction. So that's that's the secret to it, is, is make sure it's just two people. Don't do a monologue. Unless no you want to do uh, theatre. Uh, you did shoot it. Was it Charles O'Neill you shot? Yeah, two, Charles, Charles. But Charles was actually going for a big, um, was it Macbeth or Hamlet? It was one of those two. I can't remember. Uh, but he was going for a big theatre theater piece. So we, he said he was going to just self-tape him doing it, but he thought he might as well get it properly recorded. So we did a whole Shakespeare, The King. Is it Macbeth? I think it's Macbeth. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't quite know. Um, but he looked beautiful. It's great. It's a proper, it's very dramatic, but it is very theatrical. It's very theatrically shot on purpose. Beautiful location. Uh, it's a great, great little location. Of, you know, it's kind of period modern. So it was like um, walls with paint flicking off with, uh, and had like a, a gothic sort of robes that he had and he ha had a sword and everything. So yeah, it looked amazing. Uh, I think he did... Um, I think they really liked his audition. I don't know if he ever got it, um, but but yeah. So for this stuff, uh, Charles uses that. There you go. Kev says a powerful kiss and sexy scene with Lady Macbeth. Would that work? Well, same rules apply, Kev. To be honest, but you know, he could find the right theatre director that you know gets the rocks off to a bit of sexy Lady Macbeth, and boom, gets all the job. Um, but I think yeah, on a whole, man, without a doubt, use that stuff for theatre, but for TV. It doesn't really apply, even though you might be with another person in the scene. If it's shot on a stage, um, it's not going to look, you know, there's not going to be, it's not possible on a stage to get the close ups that you would need mm -hmm. for it to look like it's, you know, it's for TV or film. Um, so I'd keep that just for a theater, a theater reel, Kev. Uh, Meg Burley's in the house. It's good evening. Tad late, don't worry, Meg. It's not a problem. You can always catch up on the uh, on the replay as well. Um, so for those who are just joining, yeah, we're talking about show real tonight. We've got Chris in the house. Chris, in my opinion, without a doubt, is probably the best. I always say probably, don't I? But you are. I just don't want to fill his ego up. Um, the best show real producer in the UK. If you want something shot from scratch, this is the guy that I would recommend. Don't get paid to say that. Uh, only ever recommend anything that I use myself and pay for. So um, you know, I'm not being bribed by Chris to basically say that didn't bring him on either just to big him up so i'll stop doing that brought him in to, to um literally give you practical advice on how to get your showreel ready for the next showreel share day which is happening on may the third showreel share day is an event on twitter where oh god every man and his dog basically just pounds just stampedes twitter with their showreels um for a day everyone retweets everyone's showreels casting artists get involved agents get involved uh, like i say there's no guarantee anything will be seen by anyone in particular, uh, but it's just a really nice collaborative day where everyone supports each other and actors have discovered other actors to work with, independent filmmakers have discovered actors to work with, agents have discovered actors to sign. Um, I don't know if anybody is, if you have any tales of anyone like anything massive happening, Chris, I mean, there's been loads of like, you know, like nice things happen in terms of networking mm. and people getting agents and that sort of stuff. I've not heard necessarily uh, anybody landing humongous in but it's yeah it's all about actors connected with actors as you said filmmakers uh, so you know all you have to do is just keep getting out there um definitely just yeah the right you person know, to see your stuff literally you know normally you'll probably put a uh you know a, a showreel out it might get seen by a few dozen people or a few hundred people um on this day i mean i only tweeted mine once last year so i was quite lazy because we were doing um we were doing live broadcasts and stuff like that, but it got, you know, 5,000 like views or something like that. So you can definitely increase eyeballs on your, uh, on your work. And so that's May the 3rd. So yeah, what is to bring Chris on tonight? Really just give people some, well, motivation really to get the shit together, to be honest, We've, you've got a month to, um, to crack on with that. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions. Fiona's in the house says what to do if you've only done theater and have good footage, but want to get into TV, find it hard to get rolling films. So you've got basically, if someone's wanting to start a, a a reel from scratch, Chris, I know the answer to this because like this is what you do. Uh, yeah. But I'll let you tell um, tell Fiona kind of like you know the the process of if you want to employ somebody, Fiona, to and you want to fast track it. We said before there's ways to get into student films and stuff to get footage, but it's a real risk. One in twenty will probably be you know great and will look like broadcast quality. 
you're taking a big risk on students even completing the film, not losing the footage, getting it graded, the audio being okay. They are learning. That's the whole idea of being on the courses they're on. It's not going to be perfect. If you want to fast track it, get a professional to shoot something that absolutely is perfect and looks like it could easily have been, you know, from a top quality short film or broadcast. Chris is your man. What is the process, Chris? If people do want to get stuff shot from scratch, so, tell people yeah, again how so you go through it. If they book them with us, we'll give them some dates. And as soon as they pick the dates um, and you've paid the first invoice, then we'll then that date is yours. Then we'll have a conversation on, we'll organize a conversation on the phone where I'll get to know you a bit because essentially casting directors want to see a version of you. So if I can get to know you, then I can write specifically for you. So, you know, it ends up being like a in-depth psychology analysis, you know, where I'll get to know lots of things about you. Um, so, for example, there's a recent scene that we put out with the soldier that was returned from war uh, who has PTSD. Uh, yeah, PTSD, that is correct, yeah. Yep, and yep. Um, James Stout was telling me about how he was suffering with PTSD, so I incorporated this into the script. There's been others recently uh, people's you know taking real life events and um, making them making the scene around um, the one we did last week about the teacher uh, she was a teacher in real life so you know it's taking these th you know emotions that you may have felt you know or experience that you've gone through and then let me write about something and you can you know hopefully you'll get give a better performance so we go through that process of an hour um and then you know leave the script with us or and also you you'll need to find your other actor so i'll need to know who both actors are because i'll you know do the same process with both actors because uh you'll have a different scene so ross example you'll have a different scene working with claire than you would with megan or uh miranda or carl you know you, it'd be completely different completely dynamic. bespoke very completely yeah. it's bespoke it's written so only those two actors would be able to you know playing off their strengths um, as soon as that's sorted, you get the script seven days beforehand, and then you come to hours on the day of the shoot, nine o'clock till 10 is playtime. It's rehearsals. This is where we try out the script different ways. You can do the same script infinity different ways. So we will try different ways of playing it, different subtext. Maybe, all right, play is it your line. All right, now play is it you secretly love her. Play is if you secretly hate her try out these different things Co uh, scripts that have been written as comedies have turned into thrillers thrillers have turned into comedies um on the day because i'm playing detective watching you guys and thinking oh actually she's really quite domineering and she's quite timid but like can we incorporate that more into the scene which i have done uh, or or going oh she's quite flirty can what would be how it how would this work if we added a little bit of flirt in there? Oh, okay, that's an interesting dynamic. So it's constantly fluidly moving all the time. Then we go out um, 10, about quarter past 10, we go out onto location, we shoot it, we have a good time, get it all shot, and then you'll get your draft version of the scene within two weeks. It's I always say two weeks is the official time, but usually it's a lot faster than that, as in I've shot one this the morning. The next day. And I'm um, finishing it off now. It's almost done. It's 99% finished. So some, you know, sometimes you can even have it. I've done it with actors where you know they've left me at one o'clock and it's been online color graded at six o'clock that night. So it, it doesn't always happen because it all depends on how busy and how complex some scenes are. Incredibly complex to cut. Uh, did one the other day and it took me two days solid just working on the sound design. Um, so, you know, it's sometimes it's how long is a piece of string, how long, how complicated is it? So, okay, when you get your draft scene, which will be the very best version um, that I think it's possible because I've gone through every single take, worked in different ways. You know, I'm not just looking at your performance. I'm looking at continuity as well, what the angle of the shots are doing. So I, I edit it like it's a scene from film and TV rather than it's a showreel scene. That's what other people do, and they all do it as massive close-ups. And it's like, well, you know what? Film and TV isn't sh shot all in close-up. A close-up needs to be reserved for important moments of emphasis. It's like having a paragraph, and you put one word in bold, that draws your eye straight to that bold text. But if, you know, if it's all in bold, then it loses all context and meaning. So you know, close-ups are very 
you know, specific how I use them. Um, so as soon as you prove that, then that gets color graded and then you get your final scene. You get two versions of it. You'll get the high res master and a smaller file size, which is uh, just for spotlight. And then, so that's your scene. Go on. What were you going to say? Oh no, go on. If oh, I was about to say that's the process. So that's your scene. If you if you're obviously paying for the scene, but then you know if you're paying for showreel edit, you'll give me absolutely everything you've ever been in Coronation Street, East End, the short films, and I will go through that super objectively and cut it to ribbons uh, to get it all down time wise and, and find the right order of everything. Oh, I had an actress who had some, a couple of great scenes in Emmerdale. But there were there's a line here and a line there and a line there and a line there with lots of other actors in between and it was like six minutes so I couldn't just dump that you know which I never do dump the entire thing so I re-edited the entire scene and put the entire focus on her and it's almost all of her lines with a couple of lines from the other actors but the entire thing still makes sense that's the key you've still got to have it to make sense you can't just have a showreel where it's just people just spitting lines you've still got to understand what they uh, what they're on about yeah can we just talk about something that does my head in um yeah i think i think so many actors just you know what? and i only learned the hard way by when i was in last tango in halifax and i noticed this is the first time i noticed and they i mean you know they'd had to cut it this way because they didn't have any other takes but i noticed my continuity was off in 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 the shot from behind where I'm uh, nice scene with Derek Jacobi and Unread actually, but um, I have a folder at my side, and then and they're shooting it like from from behind me, and then the camera switches to the front, and it's yep. I mean, it's not huge, but it's quite a bit further up on like more like under my arm. Yep. I was like, oh shit! Like my continuity was off. I was you know this was years ago. It was you know probably only done three or four TV jobs at the time. This was something that we didn't get taught at drama school. Didn't get taught anything. To be honest, didn't get taught anything at drama school. <laughs> That's 15 grand down the pan. Um, but yeah, this was something that like, I think a lot of actors just forget, don't pay mind to. They're more, you know, more like, as long as my performance is good, the emotion's there, um, you know, and, and I look good. That, that's all that matters. We just tell people how freaking crucial oh, continuity oh. is. Continuity is so and huge. What it is, for those who don't know right, so continuity, the question, they don't even so know I, what it is. Okay, so you can see me here. So imagine this is shot one, wide shot, take one. Chris picks up his glasses, looks over there and taps his lip and says, yes. Right, okay, take two. Okay, let's have that again. Yes. And that won't cut at all because I picked the glasses up on a completely different hand and I tapped it in a completely different place. I've had to throw some of the actors' best performances away because they have messed up the continuity. They picked the pen up with the right hand and then in the next shot, it's in the left hand. And I've had to try and figure out ways of cutting around it. And if I can't, I just cannot do it. And it's had to go in, to go in the bin. And it's happened a few times, so I can't stress how important continuity is. Had an actress who recently, shall we say, recently, and we're talking about body language continuity, where all the, this actress had to do was fold her arms on one point and take them down on another. And oh my God, it did not happen. I saw this. Every time different. Hips, and it was every time different. I went, no, stop. You, you have to do it like this. And there's a certain point where you're running out of time going, uh, we need to do it again. And you go, I, I'm just going to have to try and fix work around this. And it was almost impossible to edit because her arms would change. Also, a head, this is a big gripe of mine, is head positions as well. So if you're off, you know, if the other actor, actor's here and you're, you're delivering it that way, and then you're looking that way, just make sure you, your head is looking the right way on the, on the line every time. And if you touch your head or something like that. You have to do that on every time. Actually, I have a tendency, it's, um, on a recent one, to, of uh, obviously you've got to brush your hair back if the wind catches it, but sometimes it's just fiddling just for the sake of it. And then you cut from a close up there and the hands up and then you cut to the hands down or in the pocket. So you have to do exactly the same thing every single time. If you've done it once and the director likes it like that, do it exactly the same unless the director tells you otherwise because he'll yeah. go right okay well 
I know you did that on that, but I'm going to cheat this shot because there's going to be another shot in between, which will buffer it, but I need you now looking here. So yeah, just repeat the same action. I think for me, when I, when I first left drama school, I think what, I think what it was is, I, you know, a part of it, I mean, this is crazy, but was like, all right, I've done it that <laughs> I've done it that way that that time. You feel as an actor, you've got to constantly give more. And then you're like, oh, you know, I'll add something else in. I'll add something else in. I said that. And then you go, holy shit, like last six times have all been different. I can't remember what I did. I've no idea what these people are going to do um, in the edit. I, I have no idea if they can even do anything in the edit. And as I've got more and more TV jobs under my belt, I've just, I've just approached it and I was like, less is just always more because yeah. you can just you know if you're like actually you know what i don't need to be fiddling with this prop at this point i don't need to be doing this so i can keep my performance spot on so that that editor can edit any angle he wants at any time i'm just gonna keep you know my movements and stuff to a minimum the like literally and unless it's absolutely essential that i do this stuff or i'm very very conscious from take one in the rehearsal, what I'm going to do, and I'll speak to the director and say, in the rehearsal, before you even got one in the can, listen, is it, you know, I'm going to do this. Do you think it should be like this? Should I not do that? In years and years, I did recently, um, I was congratulating someone. I play the boss of this data mining firm, and I'm congratulating one of the employees that they've basically got this thing they were going for. And my hands have to go down on the table. And then I sort of let, and I said, look, you did it. You got it. You're in. Um, and Every single time I was like, right, I'm going to make sure I know exactly where my hands are on that table, how many fingers are on the table, where my thumbs are, whether they're under the table, on top of the table, because if you're cutting from a close-up to a wide and my hands are in a different position, it's going to look bad. But I would never have known that had I not got continuity wrong in the past. So if we can save people continuity errors without ever having to go through them, um, just please be aware of what you're doing every single time. Because if you had to cut away people's best performances because yeah. of that, yeah, it happens, yeah. That, it's happened all the time. You go, I can't cut this because you've done something so radical. You know, sometimes you, as a director and editor, you go, right, well, my eye's over here. I can get away with it because you won't notice it. But it's when it's something massive that, you know, will draw your eye straight away. It's, okay, so we did, and this without naming names, there's a... Uh, it was uh, two shots. So two shots where two actors are sat down. So they were sat down next to each other and they're doing the scene. And this wasn't the, the, per the not the client. This was somebody that she picked to help her out. And it was that person that almost destroyed this other actress's scene, the actual client scene, because on the two shot, she does one thing. On her close up, she's doing something else. And then on. The other girl's close up, even though she's in the foreground, she's doing something else entirely differently. And it, I couldn't cut it. So I could not use the close up of the actress. So the only way for me to get through the scene is play the entire scene on that one shot. And the actress's best takes were on the close up. So I had to throw away the actress's, the client's best, actual best performance because I couldn't cut it any other way. It literally just would not physically cut because the other actress's position was so radically different and that all she had to do was sit in the same position each time. I've had one where uh, a person's gone in oh, how do I put this? with a torch uh, searching around and in one shot the torch has been in the right hand, then it's been in the left hand and then the torch has been off, then it's been on. I mean, that took some clever editing because you can't, you won't actually notice it, but by God, did that take some cuts? You know, you can edit, you know, I can edit quite quick, but some cuts, you might think that one cut may have taken me six hours to figure out how to get from point A to point B so it's seamless. And that's the key with editing. You don't want to notice it. The second it's jarring and you go, oh, there's a cut there, then you haven't done your job. So it's a thankless job, really, to make sure that nobody actually ever notices. You try and completely smooth over any cracks. Yeah, torches. I had to use a torch in that Peter Kay thing, you know, the uh, cradle to grave. Yeah. And just be, yeah, God, if you're using a torch, just be freaking like, I mean, that for continuity, yeah. Make sure you know exactly what you're putting it at on what line <laughs> and when. Because if you're pointing a torch in someone's face on one line in the wide, and then in the close up, you're pointing it at like underneath on their chest, that ain't going to work. That was something that we had to really focus on. Again, I just get so paranoid about continuity now, to be honest with you. That I'm like, you know, it's a big big part of of what i do um but yeah there's so many little things like that can trip you up and you just want to give the editor 
you know, whether it's selfish or not, you, I want to give the editor as many usable takes of me as possible. Otherwise, they'll just, you know, they'll, they'll just hear all my lines via audio and they'll focus on the person I'm talking to. If, if I'm, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. I've, had to, I've had to do that is, is switch it around and just use the audio of one actor to try and hide the bad continuity, you know, to get me from point A to point B. You have literally used every trick in the book to try and do that. So that's why I say it's so important to pick your partner, your show real partner, really well. Don't just pick your mate because, A, you know, it's acting, but also have they got a grasp of continuity? Because if they mess up the continuity, it, it doesn't just affect them, it affects you. And I might end up having to throw some of your best stuff out because I just physically, it just will not cut together. So pick a really good actor that, you know, understands continuity, you know, or go you know, take, go, Chris, who would you recommend? And I will recommend the best of the best. Yeah, Chris has got a list. Chris has got a list, haven't you, that you like uh-huh. will pimp, pimp out people. So if you are struggling for a showreel partner, um, Chris can definitely help you out there. Dougal's got another couple of questions. He said, would you suggest... Okay, it's interesting because this is something that, that we've had to get rid of over the years, Chris. Um, in my reel, uh, Dougal said, would you suggest having quite old scenes? He's got some stuff that are like five to eight years old. Uh, would you suggest having those alongside present scenes? It's been quite a big advancement in picture quality from SD to HD over the years. That's what we found has been the biggest problem in some mm-hmm. of my stuff. What's your experience around that? Yeah, it's, it's going to be picture and sound quality and also you're not going to look the same that you did five years ago. I mean, if this is the only stuff that you've got, then use it, but that really should be the first thing that goes when you get some new, newer stuff. Um, that's all I can say, really. It's, yeah, get, look to getting it replaced, get it updated. You, you certainly, I don't know how I looked five years ago, so... Exactly the same, Chris. Me and you don't age. Yeah, I don't so age. We can I'm, get away a, I'm a time lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You've got TARDIS in the background getting that. Yeah, um, yeah that was what we found, Dougal. So I had some stuff, um, not nice scene with Peter Capaldi and Juliet Stevenson called, uh, from something called Accused. I ripped it from the DVD. I tried to get it in the highest quality that I could. It wasn't even filmed in HD. It was filmed in like 2011 or something like that. Maybe even early, maybe 2010, 2009, something like that. Um, it's probably getting on for 10 years old wasn't filmed in hd so now you get something you know even from like you know one of the serial dramas you get a piece of casualty now still shot on great cameras you know in hd you put that next to a high-end drama that was shot 10 years ago it's makes it look like shit even if your performance was probably better and you were really famous people you know it just still looks like oh, okay he's still dining out on that thing that he did 10 years ago you know has he done anything new yet um so yeah needs must if you need that stuff and it really is a great performance use it but be looking to um you know if you if you do book a tv job soon looking you know have that in the forefront of your mind going that's going to be like i said before the thing that's going to go um you know when i get some some new footage as well so uh, have a lot and he says the same for corporate work footage i wouldn't put corporate stuff in with drama um dougal um what you say chris no he's saying a big no 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 you can have just a corporate no. reel uh, by yourself so i'll just cut one for a, an actor and that's just all corporate stuff because he does a lot of corporates and adverts uh you know and hosting stuff so you can have a separate reel for that but you know keep keep it keep it away from your drama stuff yeah there was one exception i've ever seen and you'll know which oh, one yes, that was, i know what, it was from the adverts and that was actually because that was more of a drama comedy rather than like a corporate video and that was yeah. i can't remember her name but donna her name was donna. Donna. Was oh, donna yeah. someone the, she was uh, amazing go compa- was it go money supermarket uh, money say yeah money saving supermarket yeah this is the brilliant advert where there was this 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 like donna was this actress um this just super strong domineering female character she was playing in this money supermarket advert and she had to completely like kick ass out of these like burly builders. builders but like yeah. she just nailed it. it was so funny so good it was uh, like a micro though, film so that's that's why it worked yeah even though it was from an advert me and chris normally like don't put any adverts in with your drama and we're like wait a minute there's always an exception to the rule here so that's another thing everything that we're saying tonight you know you don't take it as as written like that's it this is the bible everything like that chris shoots thousands of these edits thousands of these um, every time we do something like show real surgery, which I remind people who are just joining now, we're going to do on May the third in alignment with show real share day. Me and Chris will be going live for about two hours. Um, at some point that day, where we're going to play out live show reels, uh, we're going to pick them. He's going to pick them. Um, that's your job, Chris. Going to make you pick the best reels. Uh, and we're going to play them out to our combined like seventy five thousand plus followers on Facebook and on Twitter. So if you want to get involved with that, keep an eye on the Facebook group at uh, facebook.com 
um, forward slash groups, forward slash acts on this TV. Uh, go get membership at on this dot TV as well. Listen to that podcast that uh, me and Chris just put up there. Is quite, how many was that? It was recently, wasn't it? A couple of months ago. It wasn't that long ago at all. A month ago. A month ago, yeah. Um, at on this dot TV, you'll see it on the homepage. Um, but literally, if you've enjoyed what we've been talking about tonight, there's 90 minutes of really concise. We've kind of jumped all over the place tonight. Well, like really concise. It's called Seven Steps to Show Real Success. Um, someone tweeted us today to say they got way more than seven steps out of it. But we tried to make it as concise as possible. Um, within those seven steps, go listen to it. Honestly, it literally is like the best showreel education you can possibly uh, you can possibly get. Um, Sharon says continuity wise, only move if your character has a reason to move, and if she has, a, and if they have a reason to move, Sharon, bloody remember where you moved. <laughs> that's what that's what I would say. Um, definitely, I'm going to give people two more minutes to get any questions in. We've kept Chris long enough. Um, like I said, just wanted to do this. Just you know, bring someone else on. I'm going to try and bring on. Um, some more guests um, for these Monday night little Q and A's. I've also got some premium broadcasts coming out, and that's on this TV as well. Dan Hubbard, the casting director, is going to come on and do a live broadcast, very similar to this that we're doing now. It's going to be for premium members only on the website, though, and you're going to be able to pitch and ask your acting questions directly to Dan. Um, he's just an awesome guy. He did one for us before. That's available. That's on this TV right now. But I'm going to do a new one with him because that must be getting on for. It's got to be 18 months old, probably, um, two years. The stuff he talks about is evergreen, though, still as applicable today as it was when we uh, we said it back then. Peter says, I'm going to check that out. Thanks. Um, what was that, uh, Peter? I don't even know what you're referring to, me. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. <laughs> Emmeline's in the house. Says, am I too late? Emmeline, you are, unfortunately, but we're just about to wrap up. Unless you've got a question you want to ask Chris right now about showreels, and we'll get it in now. Um, but yeah, you, the, the replay of this will be available on Facebook literally the minute that I end this broadcast, so you'll be able to go back and you'll be able to, you know catch up on everything that you've uh, you've missed out on. Whilst people might be getting their last questions in, Chris, um, what how many reels have you got this week, and what what lessons are you learning? What lessons are you learning already from today? You must learn stuff new every every week. Uh, yeah, it's so much you learn. Yeah. There's, there's always something constantly you, you're learning. Um, can't really think. Um, yeah, just 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 pick your pick your showreel partner wisely. Um, you know, you know, make sure they can actually act. Are they going to turn up on time? <laughs> oh, so we ha oh, I've already told you that one. The, the guy that was almost an hour late that was a nightmare. Um, but yeah, just take your time. Make sure you get the right person because the secret to these scenes is it's. The other person that's making you look good, which sounds counterproductive, but you know, counter knowledge, but um, it really is. It's their reaction to your action that is completely selling your performance. So, the example I always use if you're playing intimidating and you bring somebody that's not a particularly good actor and they can't play scared, that makes you look less intimidating, doesn't it? Now, yep. if you're playing intimidating and you bring somebody that's really good and, uh, and can play absolutely terrified. That makes you look absolutely terrifying, which is a scene that we did um, last week with Alma, where she's playing um, a, 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 an evil teacher, a really Oh, yeah, horrific, evil you, Alma. Email, evil Alma. Alma. You need to watch that one, where Alma's playing a, a sadistic... Well, she goes from seemingly a, lo a lovely older lady being harassed by the young boy, but the young boy is like one of her ex-students, and we find out the, you know, this teacher literally put him through hell and now he's been through therapy and you know screaming in her face and she literally cuts him down with a single glance and mm. but he's brilliant so her performance is brilliant but it's it's sold by daryl who is completely goes from strong won't take shit to completely destroyed almost on the verge of tears so it completely sells her terrifying now if she had worked with somebody that wasn't as good as Daryl, I couldn't play as scared as well. That would make it look less ter ter um, terrifying, wouldn't it? So it's yeah, all about. It's about. It's it's like a, the way I always describe. It, it's like a dance. You might be the best dancer in the world, but if you bring somebody that you know is misstepping and has got no rhythm, no matter what you do, the dance ain't gonna work. It's it's, it's the two of it yeah. together. So. Or if you're doing a cha cha cha, the other one's doing a tango. The man exactly. Yeah, no, no, if you're not even on the same dance page, whatever <laughs> it's called. <laughs> there you go. Just made that one up. No, it is true go. though. It's like you know the scene that we did with the breakup scene, the ex-girlfriend scene. You know, it's not going to work if like you know it, the, the the emotion behind it is that like you're both upset. If like one person, you know, if one person isn't giving a shit and the other person is really upset, it's kind of like it doesn't make the emotion as strong as where two people 
who you're like, God, these people should just so be together. What the hell are they doing? Um, yeah. You know, if you're not invested like that, then yeah, you just must choose wisely. I think a lot of people want to get their friends involved for comfort in terms of going, I've got like moral support on set. And, you know, I always find, to be honest, I prefer acting with people that I don't know because it's like I raise my game a lot of the time. It's like, you know, if I get, you know, if I get on set on, on TV, generally don't know anybody there. Um, it makes me go, holy shit, wait a minute, I need to be good. Whereas, you know, when you're hanging out and you're just acting all the time with loads of people that you know all the time, you can become quite, you know, because like a youth club, like, oh, I'm just here to hang out, you know, and we just like have a bit more of a laugh. Um, I think sometimes, yeah, getting out of your comfort zone and working with people who you've not met before, not only expands your network and, you know, and can lead to other opportunities, but, you know, can sometimes just make you step up a little bit and go, right, that's what happens with acting classes with me anyway, Chris. You go to an acting class, the same one for six months, 12 months, you know all the people in the class. It's not mm -hmm. like day one where you're like, shit, I've got to prove myself. I need to like yep. stamp my authority on this class to go, yeah, you know what, I'm good. I'm going to show you. Six months down the line, it's like a youth club. That, that, that healthy kind of, it's not like showing off or unhealthy competition, but there is that thing of going, I need to make my mark and I need to, like show everybody here you know that i'm serious about this i think that goes if you're not careful um which is why i wouldn't stay in acting class some people say the same acting class for eight years ten years i'm like wow if you've not you know what is the left to learn at that acting class switch it up go to an acting class you've never been to before yeah that's what try you should actually do is out. yeah exactly try out lots of different acting classes because you're going to learn lots of different methods and you know pick out the stuff that works for you. That's what I did with did with filmmaking, you know, you read lots of books on, on filming, watch lots of documentaries, get taught by completely different tutors and you pick out the stuff that works for you. You know, cherry pick, you know, some stuff, you know, one person's method might not be your method. So yep. figure it out. Definitely learn go lots taste. Of different ways. Yeah, you know, taste lots of ice cream. Taste lots of ice cream because you, like. you don't know which flavor is going to be be your, your, that's what I would say. Which flavor is going to be your best? If you if I stopped tasting ice cream at vanilla, I wouldn't have discovered strawberry. <laughs> yeah. Um, Peter says I have to check out Alma's scene. Um, Small world. He shot some headshots with her last month. Um, and Sandy Jack, who is shooting with Chris um, soon tomorrow. Um, oh, tomorrow. There you tomorrow. Go. Sandy's is coming tomorrow. Awesome. Rock and roll. We'll uh, keep us posted on that. Um, so, yeah, I hope it's been useful for you guys. Just a little, um, you know, just a little reminder, ultimately. Yeah, Sherry will share days, May the 3rd. Um, me and Chris will be doing that live broadcast. Um, those listening on the audio experience, get yourself into the Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash ads on this TV. Everybody post their reels if they want feedback on them. Chris is very good at doing that. I will warn you now, if you ask for feedback on your reel, I mean, this is this is really useful, but it's fucking brutal. I can't be as honest as Chris is sometimes. <laughs> Chris is just very, very, very honest. But I have benefited from that honesty myself. Sometimes, you know, all of your friends around you will be like, "Oh, it's amazing! It's an absolutely amazing! This is great." Um, that's not always useful in the professional world when this is your career. It's fine when it's a hobby and people want to clap you and your family are dead proud of you. But if you want to make a career out of this, sometimes honesty is the best policy. If you want it, this guy will give it you. But if yeah. you do ask for feedback, be prepared to get it. And it's nothing. It's not personal, and it's everything no. to try and. and it's not, uh, you know, because I don't like or anything like that. I'm, I'm genuinely trying to help you with your real, and I can see because I've done so many of these. It's like, seeing, it's like seeing the matrix for me or seeing all the cogs and I can go, well, we, if you just remove that cog, switch that to there, that to there, that to there, and your machine, your engine will work now. So it's just a matter of switching stuff around. So yeah, don't take it personally. God, don't take it personally. Although I have had people take it personally. Um, you know, I'm just giving you genuine feedback. You know, if you want the happy, clappy, um, oh, it's really good, go somewhere else because I'm not that. Yeah. But if he does say it's really good, then, then you know I genuinely is. mean it's really good and not to change it. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, check it out. ChrisStoneShowreels.com if you want to find out more on how you can work with Chris. Uh, we'll be back on May the 3rd. I'll keep you posted with that. Go get your membership at onthis.tv. Got so many amazing premium podcasts coming up for you this week. Tomorrow I'm, film I'm filming a behind the scenes vlog of the podcast that I'm uh, recording with. Uh, one of the best accountants for actors in the country, a guy called G uh, not Jim. Um, uh, God, <laughs> Liz, Liz is right. right. <laughs> like, Glyn, Jim. Because his name is Glyn Jelly. So I was going Jim Glelly. Um, 
Glyn Jelly from Summit Account Charters Accountants in Media City UK. He's one. Of, he, he does a lot of quite famous people's accounts, actors, directors, producers, production company. Um, if you are yet to register as self-employed, you have no clue about tax, no clue about whether you need to register as self-employed or whether, depending on how far you are in your career, whether you need to register for VAT and maybe you want to go through a limited company, all these things, what you can claim back, what you can't claim back, how HMRC works, pitfalls people fall into. Going to be going over it all with Glyn tomorrow. That podcast is going to be available um, to you guys probably by the end of this week. I hope there's going to be a vlog alongside it as well. I've then going, I'm going down to London later this month to interview Susanna Fielding. She plays Jenny in Alan Partridge's, mine and Chris's favorite show. Um, this time with Alan Partridge, she's Alan's co host, who I think is responsible for making Steve Coogan's performances shine so much during this series. Do you agree with that, Chris, or what? Well, yeah, it's action and reaction, isn't it? So it's her reaction to his action that sells the awkwardness. She's just amazing. He's amazing, my hero. But, um, yeah, she just makes it um, so, so good. So I'm interviewing her, talking about that, what it was like working with Steve Coogan, what it was like basically ad-libbing those scenes, reading from AutoQ, the 90-minute improvised audition she had with Steve, everything like that, and all of her tips for people who want to get established in this industry. Also got a podcast with Jimmy Akambola, who's working with Idris Elba at the moment on in the long run. Um, Dan Hubbard's coming on for a live broadcast. It's one of the biggest cast notices like, in the country, um, probably on the planet, to be honest. Um, so much premium content. If you've not got a premium membership yet, what are you doing? It's 10 quid a month. Literally, that is it. Um, a lot of that revenue goes to charity as well, that the guests get to donate money to a charity when they come on and do a feature with me. It's a proper force for good. It's £2.50 a week. Um Look at if you if you're like oh I don't I don't have that look at what you're spending money on if you're not prepared to spend ten quid a month on your acting career two pound fifty a week probably reassess actually what's going on in your life right now um, but this will pay dividends um, go check it out would massively appreciate you being on board and helping me grow the community please spread the word um, if not you know you're like I definitely can't be a part of that right now we're still going to be back Monday nights doing these broadcasts for free I'd like to give, give you guys some uh, some value Chris any final words before we call it a night. Mm, no, I think we've covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no final words. Donna says no legend words. about Alan Partridge. He is a bloody legend. Oh, Steve oh. Conley's in the house as well. Conley says, got in late, but can absolutely recommend Chris. Dougal says, thanks, uh, gents. Uh, Donna says, thank you. Uh, genuine feedback is the best. Definitely is, Donna. Um, thank you, Dawn. Thanks again, Sharon, Fiona, um, everyone on here, Peter, Emmeline. I mean, there's loads of people on here. And thanks, everyone, who's been watching. If you are listening on the audio experience, and by the way, guys, those who are watching live right now, if you ever miss one of these broadcasts, yes, you can catch up on, on YouTube uh, and on Facebook as well. But I rip the audio of these and I put it on a podcast on iTunes and Spotify as well and Stitcher. If you just search for Act On This TV, all one word, you'll find the Act On This TV audio experience. So the audio from tonight's broadcast will be on Spotify tomorrow for those who want to listen to it and um, catch up that way and also catch up on like another 190 of these um, that are now up on there as well. So um, do subscribe to that. That's just nice. It'll keep your company if you're on your way to auditions or um, commuting, walking the dog in the gym or whatever and you want to catch up on the latest goss and what's going on in the acting industry um do subscribe at on this tv audio experience chris has got no more words neither have i james says thanks thank you james thank you bobby um appreciate you for uh, for being here thanks peter thanks everyone who's saying thanks and uh until next time chris you know <laughs> you know mm -hmm. the, the catchphrase in three two, two one. one bye for now bye for now <laughs>